want to remind you as well at um, today at four o'clock, our children's ministry is presenting something for the entire family, uh, an event called Lead Me to the Cross. It helps our children understand the, the things that occurred 2,000 years ago related to the passion of our Lord Jesus. Uh, it is a great time of learning and fun and celebration, uh, and so we encourage you. It's at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Also, this coming Friday at 7.15 will be our Good Friday service, okay? So we look forward to seeing you there. Paul the Apostle instructed his disciple, Timothy, to devote himself to the public reading of Scripture. And uh, being a far descendant from Timothy, I think it's important that we do the same. So I'm going to read to you the fullness of our passage this morning, and then we'll have it up on the screen during the various parts during the message. But just listen as I read to you from Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent his two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as they had been told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they have seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It's written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer and you've made it into a den of robbers. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we ask you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, to take these words and make them come alive to us, have impact and real application and how I live today and tomorrow and throughout the rest of my life. Do that, Lord. That's a miracle. We're open for it. Speak and let your servants hear. In Jesus' name, amen. My daughter, Allie, is a second grader. Now, I absolutely love her. She continually makes my heart full but she's different. <laughs> she is only 
slightly tethered to this planet. She sort of moves in and around in another dimension. She's witty and she loves to laugh. Sometimes I'm not sure at what exactly, but <laughs> most of the time she's content and she's not at all moody. But she cries about everything. A slight injustice, wah! Mean talk, wah! She gets overlooked, wah! She doesn't get mad, she just cries. I can't tell you how many times a day when I hear her bawling in some distant room in the house, I find myself saying, Allie, what are you crying about this time? <laughs> well, a few days ago, I heard her crying in the family room. So I walked in there to see who had hurt her feelings or said something mean or committed some sort of foul against her. And she was by herself. Allie, what are you crying about? <laughs> Daddy, in this movie I'm watching, this boy was mean to a dog and it made me cry. And I am rolling my eyes at this when she stops me in my tracks. Daddy, what do you cry about? In her plaintive little question, I heard the voice of God. I sat down on the sofa, wrapped her in my arms, and confessed, not enough, sweetie, not enough. I was doubly convicted. I can become unresponsive to crying that I adjudge to be insignificant. And I can become a spectator of, rather than entering into the sorrow in the world around me. And in our passage this morning, Jesus, who has come to reveal the Father to us, shows us that he is neither of those things. The sovereign Lord of all creation is full of mercy, so much so that he weeps over those who by their own hardness of heart reject him and refuse his mercy. He weeps over them. And the goal for us this morning, for all of us, is to treasure Jesus in his mercy and care and also for us to consider how we might extend that mercy and compassion. That we could do that with Jesus. That we could do it like Jesus. That we could do it because of Jesus. We could do it in order to glorify Jesus to whoever appears to dismiss or even outright reject Jesus. Extend mercy and care and compassion. First thing we see in this passage is that Jesus comes to rule in peace. This is Luke 19, starting in verse 28. After Jesus said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the, the hill called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and when, as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, the owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. That's the account that we have in Luke 19. Now, look at this passage, Zechariah 9, 8 and 9. 
This is the Lord speaking. He says, but I will encamp at my temple to guard it against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping watch. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, this whole seemingly kind of strange plan that Jesus gives his disciples to find, untie, and ride on a donkey, it's all included here in what Jesus is doing because it was so meaningful. Jesus here is deliberately evoking from the inhabitants of Jerusalem a picture of the fulfillment of a 400-year-old prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. And they got that, but they missed the nuance in the mode of his coming and the destination of where he was going. You see, the people's expectation at this time, at the time of Jesus, was that a messianic king would come to war against the Roman oppressors. But a king on a donkey was a universally understood sign that the king was coming in peace. And also, Jesus doesn't ride that donkey up to the Roman fortress there in Jerusalem. He's headed to the temple. It's the place created so that people could come to meet with God and come to find peace with God. And Jesus, well, he's still on that mission to approach gates, to win and be victorious over hearts. He comes to bring peace. Jesus doesn't come to stage a revolt. He comes to rescue. Now, at this point, the people, it only appears that they're receptive to Jesus at this point. And it does appear that way, because look at the words the people in the crowd are singing, starting in verse 37 and verse 38. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Where do they get those words? Well, they come from their own scriptures. They come from their book of songs, Psalm 118. But again, I'm afraid the overall context of that psalm likely eluded them. Psalm 118, verses 20 to 27. This is what the, where they got their song from. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous, that means people right with God, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me and have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. And he's made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You see, what they're singing is a psalm not about overcoming some imperial power like Rome. This is about a song about how people become right with God. It's about being saved from sin. In that same psalm, verses 20 and 21, the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. You've become, it says in verse 21, my salvation. And that salvation wasn't going to come 
through someone that they, uh, they recognized as a powerful, mighty king at that time. It would become their salvation through one who would not be accepted, one that would be rejected by the leaders. Verse 22 to 24, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let's rejoice today and be glad. The one that they're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Where does this journey lead? It says it leads to the altar where a blood substitutionary sacrifice is made. Verse 27. The Lord is God. He's made his light shine on us with bows and hand, join in the festal procession. Where? Up to the horns of the altar. And Jesus' journey here in Luke 19, where is it leading to? It's leading to an altar disguised as a cross. The last thing I want us to see here this morning is this. Jesus is moved by the trouble and tragedy that sin spread into the world. If you look back in 19, the Pharisees, they demand that Jesus silence this celebration. Again, they're giving voice to their rejection of him and their disdain for him. And then we come to this. Verse 41, Luke 19. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in. On every side, they will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You see, Jesus was not at all surprised at this official rejection of him. And by the way, the people themselves cheering him now will call for his crucifixion in a matter of days. He's not surprised by any of this, though. Back in chapter 18, he told his disciples that in Jerusalem, he would be turned over to the Romans and be killed. He also knew, and this is what he's talking about when he's weeping over Jerusalem, he also knew that within a generation, Jerusalem would be virtually annihilated by Rome as well. And that's all because of the great rejection of salvation. He knows all of this. None of this surprises him. He sees it all. He knows it all. But none of that diminishes Jesus' heart of mercy towards those who are in sin and those who bear its consequences. He weeps over that. That's what he's crying about. Real tears from a real heart grieving for those who really don't want him. And he's weeping. And I ask myself, as I ask all of you, what makes you cry? What are you crying about? We all need that heart. We all need such tears as these. Understand this. This is not a because Jesus is God thing that he's crying over Jerusalem. This is because Jesus as God was fully human. And I want to be fully human too. 
the Apostle Paul was? Think of it. Who was the Apostle Paul? Originally, he was a Jewish persecutor of Christians. And he meets Jesus, and he's born again. Then in sharing the good news about Jesus, he gets consistently and violently persecuted by his former brethren. Beatings, stoning, locked up. This is what happens to him when he just wants to bring good news to his own people. Look at what he writes in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 4. He writes this. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Those who beat him, deprived him of his freedom, and eventually took his life. Look at his heart. He'd give up everything, including Christ himself, if they could be saved. We need that. If we're going to cry, let's cry about this. John Piper wrote this. He says, there is so much pain in the world, so much suffering far from you and, and near you. Pray that God would help you be tenderly moved. When you die and stand before the judge, Jesus Christ, and he asks you, how did you feel about the suffering around you? What will you say? I promise you will not feel good about saying, I saw through how a lot of those people brought suffering upon themselves by their own sin and foolishness. You know what I think the Lord will say to that? I think he'll say, I didn't ask you what you saw through. I asked you what you felt. Jesus felt enough compassion for Jerusalem to weep. If you haven't shed tears for somebody's losses but your own, it just means we're kind of wrapped up in ourselves. We need to repent of our, of our hardness and, and ask God to give us a heart that is tenderly moved. Because then, if our heart is moved, if it's even moved to tears, we will move to help and to save. It'll cost. This will cost. Jesus was moved to tears, and then he moved ahead to the cross. The solution to heartbreaking sin and misery came at the cost of his blood and the taking upon himself our punishment we cannot and do not have to bear a cost like this. But listen to me. I don't think the cost of caring will be any obstacle at all. The obstacle is to care at all. That's the obstacle. We don't care because we have not connected. We see somebody's lifestyle and are blind to their life. We sense their politics and devalue their person. We see their self-centeredness and assume that we aren't. We think we're exercising caution by not connecting. But most of the time it's really masking disgust and fear. We forget the core of the gospel expressed by Paul the Apostle in 1 Timothy 1.15. Here it is again. I say it all the time from this pulpit. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. If Paul the Apostle thinks he is the chief of sinners, 
Who do we think we are? Make no mistake. If you have a heart for God, if you have a love for his word, a desire to increase in righteous living and holiness, and you have all those things, you have that only because God graciously saved you and gave you a new heart. None of that, none of that has anything to do with you being better or more worthy than any current unbeliever you meet on the way. Let those words move us. When we care, we connect to the lack and to the lostness and to the lives of people. That's what Jesus did. And in doing so, he wept. And then he laid down his life. And so one more time, the question comes, what are you crying about? Let's pray. Worship team coming up.